All right. Well, you have a handout. We're looking at a very interesting passage this morning. As you know, we're going to be John. And John is going to help us understand who Jesus is, what Jesus did. And if you know who he is and what he did and believe, you can find out his eternal life. So, to me, that's a very important topic. It's a very important passage. We've seen before that the Gospel of John takes us into the public, the private, and the personal ministry of Jesus. And as we saw last time, he was doing a miracle, turning the water into wine. And then some people saw those signs that he then did, and he believed. But we also discovered that Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. And of course, the question was, well, were those really believers? Were they true believers? And I would suggest they are and were, and we will see them in heaven. Because the signs were actually there to help lead people into faith in Christ. That's what the purpose of the signs were. John 20 tells us that. Uh, John 2 seems to indicate that. In fact, if you look at Numbers 14, you discover that both believing and believing because of the signs are always connected. Now, the truth is that some people's faith is definitely not as strong as others. That's true at conversion. That's also true in the Christian life. But that's simply a reflection of growing. Children grow at a different rate. Some kids grow mature quick. Some kids grow mature slow. But if you're alive, you're growing. And so in the Christian faith, sometimes they don't grow all at the same level. So this morning, we want to look at another character that we're introduced to. In fact, we're introduced to two of them, but we're only going to look at one of them this morning. The one we're going to look at is Nicodemus. Now, he can be compared and contrasted very interestingly with the Samaritan woman, who we all recall. So these two stories can go side by side, and John puts them side by side for a reason, and you couldn't find two more different people than the Samaritan uh, woman of the well. And so, anyway, we're in chapter 3, so if you would turn there, let me read a bit to kind of set the stage. How do people respond to the Son of God? John introduces it to those who reject and those who accept, but who are not trustworthy. That's why he didn't trust himself. Faith tends to have different depths and degrees. We're now introduced to a religious leader named Nicodemus who is instructed in the truth, but he seems to be utterly lost as a leader of this world. Just dumbfounded. So we pick it up in chapter 3, and you're familiar with the story. Now there was a man, and notice what we know about this man. There was a man of the Pharisees. So this is a leader, a Jewish man, named Nicodemus. Now we have a name. And he's a ruler of the Jews. Maybe he was in the same Hebrew. Maybe he was part of the inner circle that helped the lead. But we know a very specific person with a specific name, with a title, and an association. We've seen John the Baptist. We've seen his disciples, Jesus, his disciples, some people at the wedding. We've seen a number of people. But now we're looking at a very important person, Nicodemus. And this man came to him by night. Now we know when he came by night. You know, you don't do a lot of night travel. Not saying none of the things you're doing. But he went by night. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs. Ooh, right back to the signs issue. Nobody can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So you notice how all of a sudden the next person is tied into signs as well. So many believe in the evidence of the signs, but some people didn't. John's going to show us that. It's interesting that often in the Gospel of John, the actions of the crowd are contrasted with those of the Pharisees. So we've seen a crowd, and now we're going to see this individual Pharisee and how he responds. So here's Nicodemus. Kind of comes from the word Nike, Nicholas, the overcomer. The victorious one. And evidently, he had either heard or saw certain signs that Jesus had done, and he concluded this man 
must be from God because nobody can do what he does if he wasn't from God. But he comes at night. He comes at nighttime because he really didn't want to be in the light. He didn't really want to be seen by his fellow people. So he comes. So this is Nick at night, right? Nick at Again, night. Nick comes to see Jesus because Jesus didn't sign and he knows it's night. It must be somebody important. He must have come from God. So verse three, Jesus responds. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is a phrase that's used in John. It's not articulated a whole lot, but it's definitely there, this idea of the kingdom of God, this line the Messiah. The only problem is Nicodemus doesn't understand the kingdom of God, and he evidently doesn't understand the Messiah. So the kingdom of God, he has to be born again. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time to his mother's womb to be born, can he? He asked him kind of an interesting question. So uh, this causes a problem with the idea of born again, the word, or is it born from above? It can mean either one, right? So the question is, which one is it? Is it again? Like it's used in scripture sometimes, or above, which would actually fit. I think it's going to be from above, and I think I'll show you why. So Nicodemus is somewhat wrong. He said, hey, How can that be? And Jesus responds, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit. Now, notice my Bible says, and the spirit, the, and then a capital spirit. But there is no the. The article, and it's not a capital spirit. My translator here decided that's what it was. And maybe that's true, but that's clearly not what it says. At any rate, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh and flesh, that which is born of the spirit of spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. You don't know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, Nicodemus is just kind of like, oh my gosh, how, I have a, how can this be? How can these things be? This is sometimes a theological discussion that takes place, right? I mean, we have questions, God gives answers, and we're just kind of scratching our heads and how in the world can that be? So, our question here is what does it mean to be born of water? And spirit, or the question is, is it more of water? What does water and spirit mean? So, I've given you a number of options here. One is kind of the Catholic Church view that water baptism is meant, and that would be combined with spirit baptism. And the reason for that is it sounds similar to John 6 51, where we treat the flesh and drink the blood as related to communion. So, they say, John, please, water must be related to baptism. Uh, maybe not. Baptism seems to be very secondary, but many people hold to that view. Second view would be the natural versus the spiritual, right? Water is the natural, the spirit is the spiritual. So Nicodemus is thinking in terms of being born again in a womb. But no one in the scripture or the first century spoke of a physical birth this way. They would have said that which is flesh, flesh. The description is a modern convention. We use the idea that. Her water broke. But that's not what they thought back then. So maybe that's not what they meant back then. The third option, water and spirit that result in eternal life. And the reason for that is in John 4, uh, John will tell of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well and gaining living water. By gaining living water for eternal life, this water is a symbol for eternal life. Also, water is included in conjunction with the Holy Spirit in chapter 7. So that's an option. But actually, in chapter four, the woman's well, water is equated as the result of eternal life, not the agency of getting eternal life. So, if all of those are not the best option, then what is? Well, I think number four water and wind 
water and wind. Why do I say that? Because the word for spirit can be translated wind and frequently is. The word for spirit translated wind, both in Greek and in Hebrew. And Isaiah 44, and if you'll notice, carry on to page two, there is no verse 45. I forgot to put the dash in there. It's verses three through five. Wow. Yeah. In fact, I caught that this morning as I was reviewing and I went, no verse 45. I looked it up and was dash. Okay, so. Or 44 verses 3 through 5, where water and spirit are connected. But also Ezekiel 37 on the next page, Ezekiel 37 verses 9 and 10, breath of God into dry bones of the man. The spirit animates these dry bones. The spirit animates the dirt in Genesis 2, which brings him back to the dead in 37. Man must receive the spirit captured in this dual symbol as water and wind. And both come from where? Above. You must be born from above. You must be born of water and wind. Nicodemus should have understood this, but he didn't. God promised a future to his people that includes the cleansing of sin and the filling of the spirit in his Ezekiel 36. For I will take you from the nation, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will make you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I will give to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. So maybe Jesus is trying to take him back to this idea, and Nicodemus evidently didn't get it because in verse 9 he says, How can this be? He doesn't get it. And Jesus says, Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't get it? Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? I mean, can you sense the, the condescension maybe in his voice? Can you sense the bewilderment in his voice? Nicodemus, if you, you're the Pharisee, you're the religious leader, you're one of the guys, you're the teacher of Israel, and, and you know who I am, you think you know who I am, but you don't really know, do you? Because you don't even understand what the prophets. Now, this time, Nicodemus, maybe, who knows what he's speaking, he might feel a little strange, I don't know. But Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher? You don't understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, now notice, we speak that which we know. Who's the we? Who's Jesus talking about? You got some friends near him? Hmm. Truly, I speak to you. We know, uh, we speak that which we know and bear witness that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I mean, this is kind of a little gentle, maybe not so gentle slap. I mean, if you're so bent you can't pick up this, how are you going to pick up anything? You can? And I take it the we is a little ironic play on the fact that you remember when Nicodemus came and said, Rabbi, we know. We know. They don't know anything. Nicodemus doesn't know. So Jesus says, we know, meaning who? The Godhead. We know. You guys think you know, but you don't even know who Messiah is. You don't even understand being born, born from above. You don't understand what the prophets have said. You don't know nothing. And he didn't. He was totally bewildered. So Jesus ironically kind of puts him in his place just a little bit. He continues in verse 13, and no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. So, ascending, descending, we're talking about the incarnation, perhaps the future of the cross and the ascension. But then he goes back to the story. Now, Nicodemus, maybe you remember this story. Oh, come on, I hope so. You're the leader, you're the teacher. Let me bring up Moses. Maybe you'll remember Moses a little bit. 
He so he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember that passage? Turn over to Numbers 14. Numbers 14. Oh, no, 14. We were there earlier. I want 21. Excuse me. 21. 14 is where believing the Son is going to play. This is the backdrop. 21 is the exact place. Remember, the Israelites were disobeying God, and God got a little bit angry. And um, so we start in verse 4. Then they set out from Mount 4 by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. And all the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up against Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, no water, no miserable thing. What's wrong with you? And so the Lord sent fiery, venomous serpents. I don't think they spit fire. I think they bit, bit with poison. Among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, Good night, we had sinned. Because we've spoken against the Lord and you. Exactly what they did. So they say, Moses, Moses, intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpent from us. And Moses did intercede for the people. He interceded for the people. Sound familiar? Jesus is going to intercede for the people. Moses is the great deliverer. Moses is the great prophet. The prophet to come after him. Deuteronomy 18 says, Jesus is going to fulfill everything that Moses did and even better. So Moses intercedes for the people. Then the Lord said, Moses, make a fiery serpent out of, out of bronze to that type of color and set it on a standard. So I don't know what the standard would look like, but probably it's a pole somehow put them up. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, Live. Look and live. That's all. You got bit. You're going to die. All you have to do is look and you will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. It came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. That's all he had to do. Now, I, I find it interesting when you read some commentators, uh, some conservative evangelical commentators, evidently the text isn't good enough, so they have to supply some interesting backstory. So they didn't just look so that they lived, they looked and then they crawled hundreds of yards in agony from the bite on their leg, crawling to get to the serpent so they could look. And Beg that God would forgive them. I don't find that interesting. No. But if your theology says that you become a Christian by believing in Jesus and being good, then you got to say stuff like that. If your theology says the way you become a Christian is by believing, obeying, and committing, then that's the picture you have to have. That's not the picture. The picture is look and live. And if you look upon that bronze serpent, miraculously, the venom is gone and he lives. Well, back over in John, Jesus picks up that illustration in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. That whoever believes may in him have eternal life. So if you look, you live. What does it mean to live? It means that you believed by looking and you live by having eternal life. That's the parable. Moses gives us a beautiful picture and Jesus picks up on it and says, and I'm the one to fulfill, fulfill everything that Moses declared. I am the ultimate one that you look to, that you might gain and have 
eternal life. And this becomes the theme of the book, right? How to have life. In fact, how to have eternal life simply by believing in my name. And then we get to the key verse, right? This is one we all know. It's at John 3.16 verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you look, you live. So on page four, the top, as Nicodemus pondered these truths after the nighttime interview, perhaps on the roof, he would have seen the celestial backdrop in the words of Jesus. For it was Jesus who descended from above and who had been lifted up to offer a sacred sacrifice for the world which he created, who also ascended, returned to heaven to offer eternal life to all who would simply believe him for it. He offers eternal life from above as water and wind come from above to provide an infusion of life to the parched and arid ground of a heart doomed to the darkness of hell. This is our message. This is our story, right? This is, this is why so many have said that this, this text is the text, right? This is the gospel in superlatives. This is the Bible in miniature, according to Luther. This is the little gospel, A.T. Robinson. This is the Mount Everest of Holy Scripture. This is it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Now, Jerry Vines, who's a Baptist, Southern Baptist, he looked at John 3.16, he said, well, listen, let's look at all the isms that we have running around. For God, that responds to atheism that says there is no God. John affirms Jesus says, oh yes. So loved, this responds to fatalism, that it's just an impersonal force out there. Oh no, it isn't. There is love. It's not just a dark, cold, cosmos universe out there. There's love. The world. This responds to nationalism. The God only loves some people. The God only loves certain countries, certain regions, certain continents. Oh no, it's universal. That he gave. This responds to materialism. More blessed to give than to receive. Materialism says the opposite. His only begotten son. This responds to Muhammad and some of his views. God does have a son. This responds to whosoever believes to find point Calvinism. It's to the world. God so loved the world that whosoever believes. And in him, not all roads lead to heaven. One road leads to heaven. Jesus leads to heaven. And that's why John wrote this book, to help us understand. Shall not perish. There really is a hell, annihilation. Oh no, you just go out of existence and all it's all gone. You know, you go from protoplasm to manure and that's it. All over. No, no. There really is an eternality here. Everlasting life. Once you get it, you got it. Arminianism says you could lose it. No, no, this says you got it. And you shall not perish. So this is kind of an interesting passage, which is why everyone likes it. But the key is the condition for becoming a Christian. In John, it's believing. It's drinking, eating, receiving, coming. Right? These are all the metaphors that are used. But at the very beginning, it's look and you live. You believe, you have eternal life. Simple, crystal clear. Our problem is we make it more complicated, and that happened to be Nicodemus's problem as well. The consequences, they're pretty clear. Everlasting life. You're never going to thirst. You're never going to hunger. You're never going to perish. Never die. And never come into judgment, John 5, 24. This is the message we get to bring. I heard a pastor preach on TV not too long ago about I try um, not to have that. Well, one. this was a good, he was a good he was a good one. And um he said that many people say that Christianity is exclusive. 
And he said, I disagree with that. He said, Christianity is inclusive because we want everybody to come to know Christ. And that's a good statement. It, it is exclusive by the way you become a Christian, right. but it is inclusive because we want everyone to come to Christ. Now, you know how you can tell if you actually believe that? Uh, so, uh, I woke up early. I had a nightmare. Uh, someday I will tell you my dream nightmare. And it's very profound. It's not prophetic, but it is very insightful to my psyche and to what I think. And it just shows some, certain things are working. Anyway, I got up early, and so I was doing some things, and I was praying. And so I prayed for three people that I really don't like. I prayed for Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and the President of the United States. Now, I do not like any of those people. They disgust me as human beings. They are morally repugnant to me. And yet I am commanded to pray for them. And so I do. Why? Because I can't get over the words of Jesus when he's on the cross and he looked at the religious leaders and the civic leaders, and the betrayers, and all those people. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, because they're stupid. No. They don't know what they're doing. Stupid's a modern translation. But he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the cosmic picture. That's not a nationalistic thing, worrying about America in the 21st century, although I worry about America in the 21st century. But now the bigger picture is, Father, forgive them. We're, we're talking about eternity. We're talking about all eternity. And that's what John 3.16 is all about. It's all about eternity. And so if we are going to say, yeah, I really care about people, I want the best for people, we need to not limit people to the 21st century American national scene. As important as that is to me right now, there's a bigger scene. In the bigger scene, Jesus made sure we would never forget. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And this that's not just talking about politics, that's talking about eternal life issues. So I pray for those three people that, that somehow, some way, God will break through to them and help them come to know Christ. What an incredible deal. I'm convinced that's why we had a guy like Chuck Colson. Remember yeah. Colson? Colson was a wretch. He was. he was a wicked, wretched dude, and he knew it, and everybody who knew him knew it. And yet God, through people praying for him and sharing the gospel and challenging him, broke through that crusty, wretched heart, similar to yours and mine, and he heard the gospel and became a Christian, and God used the miraculous way. So God can do stuff. I was going to say that once I was in a conference and the presenter was a Jewish man. He was talking about victims of sexual abuse that sometimes they can never reconcile with the uh, the one who perpetrated the the expression. Sometimes they would have to say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And it just blew my mind because he was like busy, yeah. And some of these people have to do that. Yeah. Well, uh, if we really believe John 3.16, then we really got to ask the question, are we only wanting to pray for certain people, or are there some people we think are outside the pale of the love of God? Well, Back in our notes, perhaps Jesus had hoped that Nicodemus would reflect upon Proverbs 30. Who has ascended into the heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who... Take refuge in him. Oh my gosh, does that fit the context of their conversation? Do you think Jesus hoped that Nicodemus might have remembered? Do you think he might have hoped a bunch of Jewish people would have thought of that? I think so. So here he and we see the ascending and descending, the heavenly activities of water and wind, 
in a call of faith to receive the Spirit. But beyond it all was the challenge to know the name of God's Son. That knowledge alone can provide eternal life if we know his name. It was and forever will be Jesus, the Logos, the Divine One, who is the eternal Son of God, to whom we must look to live. Typified as a serpent on a pole in the Old Testament, offered to save men from death, now personified as the Lamb of God who dies on the cross and takes away the sin of the world, and now ascended in heaven. All that is required is that we believe on him, believe in his name. For as John declares, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these signs have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the message, whether it's to Nicodemus or to Nancy Pelosi, or to any of these people. That's the only name by which you could be saved. You're not saved because you go to the Catholic Church. You're not saved because you go to the Mass. You're not saved because you're good, bad, or ugly. You're not saved by any of those other things you do or think, or any associations you have. And we know that. So, how will you point people this week to Jesus and tell them to look and live? So, I dare you uh, to write down two people you think or know who are going to hell. And will you pray for them this week? And will you see them this week as a natural course of events? Maybe, maybe not. And if you can, will you try to see them this week and introduce them to Jesus? I mean, isn't that what we're here for? You know, someone famous said, never waste a crisis. We're in a crisis. We don't want to waste it. Do you? We have the message of eternal life. We have the words of eternal life, and a whole lot of people don't have eternal life. Is it one of the effects of praying for people that we don't like uh, that causes change in us? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Sure. It helps us to sure. It people. helps us develop the heart of God. Right. Maybe that's a desire to That is a good desire to Now, this is going to become more difficult. Nicodemus seemed to be really confused about who Messiah was. He didn't get anything. He didn't understand born again, born from above, water and wind, lift and look and live. He, he didn't understand any of that stuff. He was just bewildered. And we get a picture of a Pharisee who goes away looking dumb. He'll have another day because we're going to see him in John 19. He's going to show up with another secret disciple of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, with a desire to have the body of Jesus. So I think he came into the light. But right now it's nighttime and he doesn't quite understand everything. And so Jesus shared with them the message. Now, we have the same message and we're supposed to share the same message. But you need to understand, and I'm sure you do, Proclaiming the gospel in America is going to become more difficult because the culture has become more hostile. Religious freedom will diminish and tolerance for biblical truth and morality will decrease. Yeah. This is our new world. It's a darker world. All right. Someone's going to say, well, are you saying that if you're a Democrat, you're evil? I'm not saying that. Are you saying that President Biden is a wicked, evil person? I won't say that. Some people say that. Um, you already know part of my feelings about them, but the bottom line is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So part of my job is to pray for those people, my leaders in my country, pray for them for their eternal life, but realize it's going to become harder to do that. Arthur Schlesinger set us up many, many years ago. He's, he's talking about us, the mystic prophets of the absolute. That's us. Cannot save us. Sustained by our histories and traditions, we must save ourselves at whatever risk of heresy or blasphemy. They don't want what we're selling. They don't want to hear about Jesus. That's why the Father has to draw them. So we pray 
The Father draws, John 6, 44. No one comes to the Father, or no one comes to the Son except the Father draws some. And then we share the gospel, and they hopefully they believe. And then they are born again. But this is going to be much more difficult. Ravi Zacharias said, in denying the existence of God, and that's what we're moving, we've also denied his moral law. Without God, right, wrong, and ideas without an absolute point of reference. There can be no moral duty, there can be no universal moral obligation, it would be left to the superior to define morality, the will and the power of the superman would dominate. Well, we're going to watch the power of the state declare ethics and morality. That's what they're going to do. We already have. And they have, and they'll do more. What are we going to say to the people who say we have a president who's a devout Christian because he's a devout Catholic? I mean, uh, you can say in appearance, in appearance, but I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a devout Catholic. Yeah, but the Pope, Pope, Pope did that. But the Archbishop in San Francisco. Whoa, whoa, we've gone from the President to the Pope to the Archbishop. The Archbishop. Well, in the world. What would you say to someone as you're trying to witness Well, would not say that. The Archbishop of San Francisco spoke against against Nancy Pelosi this morning. So, So, you know. I think we're going to have some dialogue about this in the country, and we need to be the ones to not leak and start becoming screechy and all that. We need to be men and women of reason and be winsome in our approach, right? Grace and truth. Some of us are all that truth. Well, a little grace and truth. We need to flex both muscles. Conviction, compassion. We flex them at the same time. We don't get all hot and bothered. Don't get fired up by all these people who want to fire you up. We want to provide a faithful presence in the midst of this craziness. I'm not saying you don't speak against it. You do. But we do it in a way that they can't marginalize us just because we're yelling. Tasker. It seems to me that whoever you're witnessing to always tries to get you on the same subject. And we need to be very aware to keep the main thing the main thing. Always directing the back. I don't know about Biden. I don't know about Rosie. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. Yeah, we do need yeah. to keep the main thing the main thing. And and we don't know about people, right? I mean you can you know you can just conclude about um, whether it's Pelosi or the president of the United States or the former president of the United States. I don't know. What I do know is I'm supposed to pray for them. I'm supposed to share the gospel with them. I have my views. I have no problem sharing them. I'm not trying to brainwash anybody here lest I get in trouble. But I don't mind calling some questions out. One of the things I think we need to realize is, as James Wall put it, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood or the good or evil side. With each choice, God speaking to us, offering each the boom or blight, then the man or nation chooses for the darkness or the light. I think our nation is chosen for the dark. I think we are in for some dark days. And that has never hindered Christianity. It's killed people. But the gospel is not hindered by environment because it's built on relationship. So we need to not create an environment of hate or an environment of screeching, but an environment of relationship. Will we be abused? Yes. Will our lives be more difficult? Absolutely. Is God out of control? Not a chance. Does he know what's going on? Of course. Does he want his church to be faithful? Absolutely. In fact, the church is supposed to be the pillar of truth, right? Carl Jasper put it this way, the future of mankind. This is a Jewish religion-oriented philosopher. In today's problem-filled world, the best chance may lie in the churches. He doesn't even go to church. Insofar as their members still believe. But the church 
must have a deeper influence as it is always claimed on every individual. There, its demands must become so serious, so strict, so clear, so unconditional, without adjusting to average frailty and to the evil men. However, if they, the churches, cannot rouse themselves out of their entanglement in worldliness and worldly cunning to an earnest faith in God, then they will drift along with the rest on the road to perdition. He's not sure where the church is going to go. He's not sure what the church is going to do. Well, I'm not responsible for all those churches out there and all those denominations out there. I don't go there. I go here. You go here. We're members here. We are responsible for what we, we individually do and for what we do as a class and what we do as a church. It's going to be more difficult. It's going to be more challenging. Hopefully we'll pray more, think more, read more, encourage one another more, but never forget what the main thing is. So if you say the days are evil, live nobly and you'll change the times. We're to be a faithful presence in a very dark world. That's what the church has always done. We just have happened to have lived in the most beautiful 250 years ever in the history of the world. And it's all going to change. And we're going to be the church, victorious, as it's always been. Brad. Was there any other reference in church history to Nicodemus? Any other reference in Bible history? No. Well, yeah, well, church history. I don't know about church history. There, I know the next one's in, in the, uh, John 19. Where he comes to get the body of Jesus. Yeah, but after that, I mean, after. Not, nothing's coming to my mind. A lot of people show up for a brief time and close out. Yeah. Father in heaven, we do pray to you. Help us not be discouraged. Help us not be downtrodden. Help us be your church. Knowing that one day we are victorious and knowing that your spirit indwells us and that the spirit who indwells us is mightier than the spirit of the age. Give us confidence in that, Lord. Cause us to draw close to you, to draw close to your word, to draw close to one another, to be encouraging one another and sharpening one another. And Lord, we pray your hand of protection upon this church and for us who are the church. Give us what we need that we might be what we need to be, a faithful presence. Come and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.